Welcome everyone to the next Bioinformatics podcast, where we discuss the latest advancements at the intersection of biology and informatics and celebrate the brilliant people and companies that are changing the world through advancements in genomics and life sciences. Our first guest on the next podcast is Phil Ewells. He's a lead for bioinformatics development for the National Genomics Infrastructure as part of SciLife Lab in Stockholm, Sweden. He's the author of MultiQC and he's the co-creator of the NF Core project. Welcome, Phil. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, great to have you. First broadcast as well. So SciLife Lab, Science for Life Laboratory, is an institution for the advancement of molecular biosciences in Sweden, and it's funded as a national research infrastructure project by the Swedish government. Their vision is for Sweden to be a world-leading nation in life science infrastructure. So let's start off with a little bit of context around you, Phil, how you made your way into the wonderful world of bioinformatics and find yourself at SciLife Lab. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I guess, uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, uh, I'm from the UK originally. So a uh, pretty traditional academic kind of career path that, for the start, at least. Uh, I did a PhD uh, in the lab, actually, um, working with epigenetics in, in Cambridge in the UK, working at the Babram Institute. Um, and uh, kind of always had a bit of an interest in computers and 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 coding and, and kind of been doing website design as a hobby for years when I was a, like a teenager. And sometime during my PhD, I kind of clicked, started getting in this, this like sequencing data from, from the old uh, Illumina GA, GA2X sequences, which were brand new at the time. And, uh, and realized that stuff I'd been doing for fun in my spare time was actually quite transferable and started to code for, for biology instead and, and realized that was, that was what I wanted to do. Everybody Sorry. follows a kind of winding road into their into their career, don't they? I started engineering and physics and ended up in computer science. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you never really know what you're going to enjoy until you start doing it, I guess, by accident. <laughs> exactly. So you've been involved in some uh, really cool projects. I hear a lot about MultiQC and NF Core, of course. So uh, tell, tell us about some of the open source stuff you've been involved in and what's going on there. Yeah. Again, that's it's my kind of historical accident, really. Right? So I, when I started working with bioinformatics in Cambridge, the guys at Babram have got a real strong streak for, for open source software. It's, I was working in the same group as Simon Andrews, who wrote um, FastQC, which is probably one of the most commonly wrote, run bioinformatics tools there is, certainly in genomics. Um, Bismarck by Felix, is, Felix Kruger is another one for very commonly used in, in methylation. There's Hiccup for high C data. So those guys who were around me were already in, in the business of writing open source software, and, and I, I loved it. So I kind of got involved straight away and uh, started powering out my own projects. Um, simple, small stuff at first. I actually wrote my own workflow manager back in the day called Clusterflow, um, back when, when kind of this, this was starting to become a problem uh, to manage these workflows and, and kind of progressed through. And I've, I've never really set out with that as the aim for what I've been doing. I've just had a problem in front of me, needed to solve it. And whenever I end up writing some scripts to do stuff, I try and package it as a tool which other people can use. And sometimes people never find those tools and they just quietly die in obscurity. And sometimes I accidentally hit a niche and, and that's definitely what happened in MultiQC. That was just meant to be an internal reporting tool for, for us and now it's used by people all over the world. Um, with NFCore, it's slightly more explicit, but the, the precursor to NFCore, our pipelines, again, we were just writing for ourselves and, and, and it became clear that, that it was something that, that would be more widely, widely usable for, for the scientific community. And, and I love that feeling of being able to kind of write something for myself and it, but it be useful for others as well. I guess that makes sense. That the useful things for you tend to tend to take off. That's the way a lot, a lot of projects start. But tell us more about NF Core. It's really starting to to take off in its own right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's certainly the most uh, explosive project to date that I've been part of. It. It's. Um, just jump from strength to strength when it started. I mean, we only started it in 2018, I think. So it's not been around for very long. But I mean, we're, depending on how you count the community, we're, we're kind of numbered in the thousands now, certainly in, in hundreds of contributors, which is, is amazing. Um, it's really taken on a life of its own, which is great. Um, but, but anyway, so the, the background for NF Core, for anyone listening who's, who's not familiar, it's, um, it kind of came out of us working with, with Nextflow and with Nextflow Pipelines. And internally, we started kind of coming up with style, style guidelines and, and templates to, as we were making lots of pipelines. And, and again, thought that this would be generally interesting. And uh, because 
Nextflow is really the first workflow manager tool that I'd been uh, in, in touch with, which was truly portable between different infrastructures, different compute systems. It kind of seemed crazy that everyone was in their own research institutes building their own pipelines to do es essentially the same things. So um, together with uh, some people I met at the Next Nextflow um, conference, actually, the, the Nextflow hackathon, primarily uh, Alex Peltzer in Tübingen in, in Germany at Cubic, um, we, uh, we kind of sat down and talked about this and how we could work together and um, stripped off all the institutional branding we had from, from the pipelines we were already working on, branded it as NF Core instead and tried to open it up as much as possible. Um, yeah. So now we're, now we're like this community of people all working together on, on the same set of pipelines which are used all over the world. Uh, and it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> I, think we've got I, I guess that's why it's gained so much momentum. It's just got, uh, it's got so much utility for all these different people using the, the same pipelines and just seems to have taken off. Like you said, there's, you know, thousands of users and what a couple hundred companies involved. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah I think, uh, when we were first kind of starting it, we, I was trying to keep it a quite stealthy rollout at the start while we were ironing out the bugs. And then Paolo, the main developer behind Nextflow, tweeted about it. And suddenly we, we had this kind of jump of interested people. And I was like, well, we're not ready yet. But, but that was a really good learning lesson because um, time and again, it's not, just, it's not just me. It's not just any, you can't put a finger on anyone within NF Core that's key to its success. It's, it's the whole community as a, as a whole, which is, which is responsible. Um, and that's really fun to be part of, you know, it's just stuff happening all over, all over the place. Uh, yeah, no doubt. I, I talk, every next full customer I talk to now is, you know, grabbing something or any seek or something from, from NF Core and, and using it. So that's fantastic. It saves, saves them a lot of time to get up and running and, not yeah. uh, going through the same trial and error that everybody else has gone through before them. Absolutely. So let's shift gears. We've seen a lot of breakthroughs in bioinformatics in the last few years, and a lot of infrastructure technology has emerged and changed to help you achieve your work. What do you see as the technical challenges for bioinformaticians today, Phil? Uh, sure. I mean, it depends. It depends. It depends what you're doing with your bioinformatics, but I think certainly as we're moving into this kind of era of biology which is more and more high throughput we've been saying this for years but the exponential growth keeps growing i think this kind of the coordination aspect is, is what i work with so i'm biased but the coordination of these large-scale analyses keeping track of all your data and and it's just such a such a big thing that you can't possibly keep everything in your head at once so so kind of that coordination of large-scale analysis and, and all the data management i think is one of the key things which is new, which is particularly difficult um, technically. Uh, right, right. Yeah, that data management, I mean, you hear about that and in my you know, prior years in HPC in the cloud where data management's still the challenge and we're hearing about it now with genomics and, and we hear about it all the time with machine learning as well. So, you know, we're seeing more and more machine learning being applied in life sciences. Uh, how do you see other new technologies being applied to bioinformatics and sort of where do you see opportunities down the road to to sort of change what, what we're doing and what technologies might come into play? Yeah, I mean, machine learning is really exciting. I mean, I'm not, I don't do so much myself with it, but I think we're starting to see new, new possibilities being opened up with it. It's kind of its own new field. Um, tools like Deep Variant coming out, which are kind of like proof of principle, but now also more and more tools coming out, which, which wouldn't really work in any other way. So I think that's really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of other technologies, I mean, uh, certainly there's lots of scope for kind of, I guess you can use ML for, for optimization of things a lot, like kind of learning from, from common processes and trying to synthesize all that data. But, um, and then just more generally, I think it's really exciting to see um, a lot of this kind of new customization coming out and using new, new, new technologies, like actually making use of GPU processes, um, kind of more specialized hardware, uh, things like this, which, uh, it was fairly unthinkable not that long ago when we were kind of smaller players, but as bioinformatics scales, uh, all, these, all these things are coming into play and uh, making some radical changes, which is fun. Exactly. Yeah, I've spoken to a lot of people with the differences between research software engineers and bioinformaticians, and certainly we we're, uh, we're at the annex of that here in this, in this podcast, but how do you think about those differences in the disparate skill sets that are needed for this kinds of research? Yeah, we've got we've got a job, job advert at the moment and uh, open and like I called it by informatician. Mm -hmm. we're, we're joking about it on Twitter because uh, I'm kind of saying what does by informatician mean? You know, one day 
one day you're you're deploying a cluster and your systems admin the next day you're doing an analysis project for a research group and you're a uh, data analyst you know um it's a bit of a kind of catch-all term but i mean i said in the introduction i started off in the wet lab i'm a i consider myself a biologist who learned to code and i sit next to people who are kind of um you know trained computer engineers who who learned the biology and and there's this is nice kind of melting pot in the middle where everyone's had to learn something to get get to where they are um and it's quite difficult to find anyone who's an expert in everything and so i think you have to pick pick for the, the tasks that you're most interested in and when you're building a team with bioinformaticians you need to try and make sure that you have kind of people who who specialize in, in all the different fields you, you need which is quite broad <laughs> Yeah, and I guess it's challenging too, not just to define the role, but to find the people. We're seeing so many ads for bioinformaticians and seeing Nextflow in all kinds of, of different ads. I looked the other day and there were 130 advertisements that mentioned Nextflow. So it's, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a challenge to cha hire people, I'm sure, these days. So yeah. tell us, uh, SI Life Lab, what, uh, what techniques are you championing there? Yeah, I mean... Um, computationally, of course, we've always got, got uh, NF Core, <laughs> as, as we make, I, I try and make as much noise about it as possible. But, but I mean, we're, we're not just bioinformatics, so obviously the National Genomics Infrastructure, where I work, we, we push a lot of new stuff in the lab as well. Um, so, that, I mean, the, 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 the big one at the moment for us, which is really exciting, is um, spatial transcriptomics and, and spatial technologies, um, kind of this concept of being able to combine optical microscopy data with uh, with genomics basically, and so taking taking an RNA set an RNA seq data set, but knowing where in this tissue slice all these different transcripts came from, um, which is just fun, uh, so exciting, it's so visual, it's really nice. Um, and that I mean, also we've got we've got um, a big um, nanopore promethean machine coming in for us soon, so we're we're really excited about long read sequencing um, and nanopore. Uh, but also we have PacBio. Um, and, and all the different applications. We've been the kind of big players for doing um, de novo genome assembly. It's a bit of a soft spot of ours uh, for a while. And, and we've been doing that with other technologies like, like make pair sequencing and stuff on Illumina in the past. But now we've got uh, these fantastic long read um, assemblies coming out and we're pairing that with things like high C and we're starting to kind of just go to chromosome level, perfect assemblies in kind of one sweep, which is just amazing. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of exciting techniques going on. That, that is amazing. Mm. Blows me away what's going on in our industry. It's very cool. Mm. Okay, that's that's great, Phil. I, I learned a lot and had some fun, but I wanted to move into my favorite part of the podcast or what I hope will be the favorite part. It is the first one, so we'll see. But this is the rapid fire section where I ask you a quick question and you give me your immediate thoughts in kind of 60 seconds or less. So let's start it out with what is your favorite book and why? Well, yeah, favorite book is tough. Uh, I've Probably something uninspired, like Lord of the Rings, you know, classic. I'm, I'm reading two good books at the moment, actually. Um, uh, what's it called? The, the Prisoners of Geography is really good. Uh, it was written, uh, the version I've got is a few years old, and it makes all these, it's all about geopolitics, and it makes some really uh, amazing um, predictions, which have already come true by the time I'm reading it. So that's really cool. And uh, I've got another one as well, which is a bit more niche, The Hidden Life of Trees. It's all about trees. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. That book, uh, Prisoners of Geography, sounds interesting. I'm definitely going to check that one out. I'll make a note right now. <laughs> so uh, what do you think the next five years look like for NF Core? Uh, just bigger bigger and better, hopefully. I mean, the community shows no signs of slowing down. So my hope is that we continue to grow. Um, it's really exciting to see us start to branch beyond just genomics now, starting to get more proteomics pipelines and, and all kinds of other fields. Um, so yeah, the more people, the, the problem we're solving with standardization and, and these technologies applies to any any field really. So it, it's really nice to try and broaden that out. So I hope in five years we'll, we'll be all over science. <laughs> As a UK transplant in Sweden, what is your favorite Swedish food? <laughs> uh, so I, I'm vegetarian, so I can't say meatballs, um, I'm afraid. But uh, <laughs> uh, some of the pastries and some of the, the sweet things here are, are fantastic. Um, just coming up, coming up to Easter now, we're starting to see um, a Swedish delicacy called uh, a semla, which is oh, just so good. It's uh, like a little little bread roll with cream and almond paste inside, and oh, it's delicious. 
So, yeah. That sounds good and low and low calorie. I think Swedish, Swedish meatballs are the are the hit over here when you go to uh, go to IKEA here in Canada. So I'm in Canada, as I just said. What what food do you think of when you think of Canada? And everybody gives the same answer here. Is it going to be maple syrup? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's like that's the only thing we have or eat here. I think everyone thinks of that. That's cool. How do you feel about the future of remote work with respect to bioinformatics teams? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's been a really interesting year, of course. Um, for a lot of reasons but I mean personally I basically haven't been into work physically since March last year I guess in fact it was the, the NF Core hackathon when London that was like the last time I went into work was just before that um, of course for, for many people working by informatics I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference to be working from home really um, I don't think our productivity has dropped all that much and I'm like most people pretty happy working from home I think but um, still do definitely miss some of the social aspects of work. Um, so I think I personally would hope that at least a, a partial work from home attitude going forward in the future will be a bit more, a bit less stigmatized. Yeah, sure. That makes, it makes a lot of sense. I think we're seeing lots of productivity in, in uh, computer science as well, where people, you know, traditionally been working from home and I guess the dry lab, the wet lab, it doesn't work so well being at home. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have for bioinformaticians out there listening who are looking to enter into the field or maybe even their biologists or computer sciences that want to make that transition into the uh, the other area yeah um just get get find something you you a problem you want to solve and, and get involved and get involved in in the open source communities because it's a great way to learn and a great way you learn, in fact, at the end of the day, the way that most people learn is from other people and um, from kind of really getting into, into code. And that's the way I learned to write Python. It was by having my pull requests pulled apart by colleagues. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so especially with bioinformatics, it's not uncommon to be uh, feel quite isolated if you're one of only a small number of people or by yourself in a group working with this kind of stuff. So joining a community like NFCore, of course, or any other open source project is a great way to kind of um, get involved with it and get mentoring from other people and, and kind of, yeah, up your skill set, I guess. Well, that wraps us up, Phil. Thanks a lot. I had a lot of fun with this, the inaugural broadcast. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you and, and learned a lot. So uh, we'll see you in the, in the travels and thanks a lot for uh, joining us today. Yeah, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh -huh.